Good morning and happy Mother's Day. God bless you ladies. We just want to thank you for the wonderful ladies of our church and for those moms out there who are celebrating today. May you be blessed this day. Amen. So let's open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you. First and foremost for the great salvation that we have in your Son, that you sent him into the world to redeem us and reconcile us to you through him, Lord. And we thank you today, and we thank you for those godly moms, those godly examples, Lord, that would train up their children, and for those moms out there that are in the church, persevere, persevere, and train up your children in the ways of the Lord, and just keep them in prayer, and watch over them, and know that someday there will be fruit from your labor as a godly mom, as a godly parent. So we just want to bless all our moms today, all our ladies today. Just bless you, and may the Lord keep you and watch over you, even as uh, we progress to being older and become grandparents, that you continue your walk with the Lord and your influence on your children and grandchildren's lives. And we just thank you. In Jesus' name we say, amen. So I'm going to begin today's message with a kind of a, a, what seems like to be a strange passage of Scripture to use on Mother's Day. But you'll see how it kind of ties and fits in when we talk about our Bible character today. So the passage is from James, chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, and many of us are familiar with it. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers or sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So according to these verses, we face tests and trials to what? Increase our faith. We are confronted with them in order to what? To help us persevere and become mature in our walk with the Lord. Now, I taught school for 30 years, and we would give tests to the kids to see if they understood. And so the Lord does that with us, tests us so that we can mature in our faith so we can mature and develop those fruits of the Spirit and become more like Him. But let me ask you a question. What does it mean to persevere? How is perseverance defined? Well, according to Webster, it means to persist in an undertaking or situation in spite of opposition or discouragement. And a good visual from Scripture, if we were to look at Luke chapter 18, we would see the persistent widow who goes before the judge and goes before the judge and goes before the judge and listen, we're not talking about the outcome, but what we want to look at is the widow who is persistent in her prayers. She persevered in her prayers and went before the judge. Well, this morning being Mother's Day, I would like to look at a woman in Scripture who persevered under some challenging, challenging family trials and was able to overcome because of her faith, her faith in the living God, the same God that we serve. So for today's message, let's look at the perseverance of Hannah the mother of Samuel, and uh, we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verses 1 to 8 and see how she persevered in spite of opposition and discouragement. So if you will, turn with me in your Bibles or go to it on your phone or your tablet, and let's read together 1 Samuel 1 verses 1 to 8. There was a certain man from Ramathion, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not have any. Yet year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of his meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Keep that in mind. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah say to her, said to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downcast? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more than you than ten sons? The first thing I'd like to look at this morning is Hannah's perseverance within the dynamic of her family. 
First of all, she persevered in spite of the difficulties. Listen, as soon as the passage opens, we see some dynamics here. With Hannah, she was, she was married to Elkanah, but he had two wives. And church, listen, this was not and is not God's plan for a marriage or God's plan for a family. A marriage is supposed to be between one man and one woman. Listen to Genesis 1, 22 to 24. It says this, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. In the Hebrew, it is the word ekad. It's a union. It's a cleaving together. They become one flesh. Now, this was the design for the family. One man, one woman would be in covenant relationship, and the two would become as one flesh. Now, if we look at this marital relationship, it's really a reflection of Jesus and his bride, the church. So if we were to look at Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, we'd see that pattern. And as we get to the end of those verses, it said this is an example of Christ and his church. So we're his bride, and he is our bridegroom. And the word of God is very adamant in Scripture about this relationship. He is very jealous for his bride, and he wants nothing to come between himself and his people. And anything that does stand between him and his people could be or would be considered an idol. And the Lord wants no rival to him as our first love. Just read the first two of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 to 6. Now, if we take this principle back to the marriage, we must understand that there should be no rival between a husband and a wife. Yet what we see here is that Hannah finds herself in a polygamous situation with Penina being a rival wife to her husband, Elkanah. This is not the Lord's design, and it will create difficulties within the family, within the household. And church, as we go through scriptures, we can see the difficulties that came from such a situation. Anybody remember Abraham, Sarah, Hagar? Listen to Genesis 16, 1 to 6. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai's wife took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. So the problems erupt right away. Then Sarah I said to Abram, you're responsible for this wrongdoing that I am suffering. Now, could you see Abraham scratching his head, saying, you asked me to sleep with her and build a family through you. Now you're blaming me for the situation. So already, again, we see strife happening. She said, I put my slave in your arms, and now that she, sh she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. You're so Abraham said, your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah I mistreated Hagar and so she fled from her. Do you see the strife when we don't do it God's way? God told Abraham that he would have a seed, but he proceeded to do it in his own way, married another woman, slept with her, she became pregnant, and we see conflict between Abraham and Sarah, Sarah and Hagar, and between Ishmael and Isaac, the boys who were offsprings of the two women. And that conflict continues today as what? Ishmael is the forefather of many of the rape, uh, people who are now uh, following Islam. And Isaac is the forefather of those who are Hebrews, following Judaism. And look at the conflicts we have today when they step outside of God's will and God's plan. And I want you to see something, that the rivalry and strife uh, occurred because Abraham veered away from the plan of God, which created a lot of animosity within his family. And we see the same thing happen with who? With Jacob. He has Leah. He has Rachel. He has all the concubines and, and maidservants. And there's conflict between Leah and Rachel, fighting over their husband. All right? So whenever we get outside of God's plan, there is usually difficulties and conflict. And this is the type of situation that Hannah finds herself in. It's discouraging. And as we'll see, there is opposition because it is not 
the design plan of God. And yet, she chose to persevere because of the covenant she made with her husband and the covenant she made before God and because of her faith in Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, let me make a practical point of application here. And let me start with the men first. Now, obviously, we don't live in a society where we practice polygamy or can have two wives. However, that does not mean that we cannot create a situation where something rivals the affection for our wives. It can be work, sports, television, a hobby, the phone, the computer, social media, fill in the blank. Husbands, listen carefully. Please listen carefully. After our relationship with the Lord, which nothing should rival, the most important relationship that we should nurture and secure is the one with our wives. And why? In order to create an atmosphere of security for our wives, she should believe that in our heart of hearts there is nothing more valuable, except Jesus, of course, than she is. She should stand on the pedestal of our lives, quote, unquote, if you will. After our relationship with the Lord, our relationship with the wife, our wife is the most important. And it sounds like cliche, but happy wife, happy life. And listen, we could get into a whole nother study, but if you read 1 Peter 3, the Lord will not be attentive to our prayers if we don't love our wives as Christ loved the church. So we want to make no rival in her mind between us and her, okay? Or us and our wives. And ladies, the same goes for, for you. There should be nothing that rivals your affection and attention for your husband, whether it be work, social media, the gym, your girlfriends, right? Other things that you could fill in the blank. But be very careful. Listen carefully. Be very careful when your children come along that all your attention and affection doesn't turn to them and you create a rival situation between your husband and your children. They will take up a lot of our time, the kids, but it should be co-parenting. But we should always spend that time to make sure that the husband-wife relationship is secure and there's no rival between the two. Parents, it's a joint effort to raise children. A joint effort to bring for, uh, raise up those who are brought forth from our union. But listen carefully. We are husband first and wife first and parents second. If you want to live and have harmony within your home, nothing should rival the love you have one for another. Amen? And the second point of application is this. Even if a rival situation occurs, and I'm not talking about abusive situation, but a rival situation that something has kind of interfered with the relationship within the marriage, then take the proper biblical steps in dealing with it and persevere under the grace of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit to come together and work things out in the eyes of God. Amen? And by, through faith and grace and the power of the Spirit, we can work through these things if we trust the Lord. All right, let's go on and see how Hannah persevered in spite of discouragement. Let's look at verses 2b and 6 to 8 again. It says, Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Then 6 to 8, because the Lord had chosen, had closed Hannah's womb, a rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. But her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you so downhearted? Don't I mean more than you than ten sons? How easily Hannah could have become discouraged because she was barren and a rival wife, Benita, mocked her, ridiculed her, as to really position herself as the rival, uh, rival female or alpha female, if you will. Penina was using her ability to have children as leverage, leverage to gain favor over Hannah with her husband. All the criticisms, feelings of inadequacy made life miserable for Hannah, but she persevered and continued to fulfill her role in the household. And family, the pra practical application is this. No household is perfect because it's filled with what? Either redeemed or unredeemed sinners. There will be times when there's dis uh, disagreements, and sometimes strong disagreements will occur. There are times when the family dynamics become extremely, extremely stressful, and we can become discouraged. And it's at this point that we have to cry out to God and go to Jesus 
and look to apply those biblical principles within our own lives and within the lives of our marriage. And again, lean on him to bring those discouragements, to bring those conflicts before him so as we can work through them through biblical principle. Amen? There's no time to quit. We want to persevere in the covenant we made before God. Listen to Galatians 6, 7 to 9. It says, Don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. Let, in other words, let us persevere, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Family, when things rise up in our home, we can respond in the spirit or we can respond and do in the flesh. However, according to God's word here, the manner in how we respond in situations is the manner from which we will reap. We can become bitter, we can become angry, depressed, etc., or we can seek the Lord and respond in a Christ-like attitude within our marital relationship, within our family, to bring a healing and a solving of the problems that do rise up. And they will rise up. We live in a sin-cursed world. We're still wrestling with an old flesh nature, if you will. But when we recognize it and then try to work it out in, in God's way and through God's word, we can come to consensus and conclusion and work things out. Amen? All right. So let's see how Hannah persevered in spite of her desperation. Family, sometimes we may feel a sense of desperation in the circumstances we find our families in. It could be illness, financial setbacks, unexpected circumstances, conflict, etc. They can infiltrate our homes and cause us despair, at least for a moment or for a season. Look at Hannah's situation. In, in both uh, verses 5 and 6, Scripture tells us that Hannah was barren. And her situation, right, was of the Lord's doing, for it says, the Lord had closed Hannah's womb. But hang on to that, because we're going to have to look at this in the bigger picture, if you will. And church, listen, for a woman to be barren and have no children, it left them with a, a bit of uncertainty for their future. In ancient times, there were no pensions, no government assistance program, no life insurance policies, etc. If anything happened to her husband and she was barren, okay, she was in trouble. Because if anything did happen to her husband, she had children. It was up to the children to care for their mom, especially the firstborn son. It was his responsibility. So if this support system was absent, it could create what could be seen as a desperate situation for a woman who had no children. But what I want you to see here is Hannah doesn't go down this road. Instead, she chooses, chooses to persevere, persevere in the, her faith and trust in God. Family, listen. This is a woman who trusted God in spite of her difficulties, in spite of the discouragements, in spite of the tests and trials, in spite of what seemed to be a desperate situation. I want you to see that Hannah's faith was a personal faith in the sovereignty of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She believed in Yahweh. Look at chapter uh, 1, verses 10 to 13a again. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow saying this, Lord Almighty, if you will look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. No razor will be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Eli the priest, Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. And I want to see, look at something here. The Lord closed her womb. Now, in the sovereignty of God, did he use that so that when Hannah got to this point and she was crying out to God for a child, that she would dedicate the son to the Lord for all the days of his life? Did he allow this situation to happen? Of course he did, because he's above it. Knowing that she would then dedicate this, this uh, firstborn son to the Lord, and this child would become Samuel, one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Okay, So I wonder if she would have had children prior if at that point she would have dedicated her child to the Lord. Possibly not. But by going through this circumstance and situation, she makes this vow to God. But with that said, who did Hannah turn to? Where did she place her trust? It was in none other than the Lord God of Abraham, the Hebrew God, Yahweh, our God. 
The first thing I want you to see here is that Hannah uses the term Lord in her prayer. This is the covenant relationship um, word for God. She uses the term Lord. She's praying out of a covenant relationship with Yahweh, for he was the only one, the only one who could change a situation. He's the only one who can bring life. Hannah knew that God was the giver of life, so she cries out to him in faith and trusts him to guide her and direct the watercourse of her life. Whichever way it go, whether it be yes, wait, or no, she was going to trust in God. And what I want to do is make two points of application here. Moms, be a woman of fervent prayer for your family, for your husband, and for your children. Pray for God's perfect will for your family. Listen to Philippians 4, 6 to 8, and how this fits in. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And we will see that as a result of Hannah's prayer, she receives that peace and trusts God. And I, may I suggest as your pastor, find a quiet time. Find an alone time. As if anybody saw a war room, get in that prayer closet and cry out to God for your children. Cry out to God for your husband. Cry out to God for your marriage, especially in the times we live in. Put a covering of prayer over them. Cry out to God for your family. Intercede for them. And please, not just a flare prayer, as my pastor used to call it. Oh, God. Oh, God. No. Let it be a time where you get alone with God and you wrestle and dig in and cry out in fervent prayer like that persistent widow for your family. And you may be tired and overwhelmed by difficult circumstances or even flat out discouraged. And the devil may be speaking in your ear, what does it matter, throw in the towel? Well, let me tell you, this is the time to get in that prayer closet and cry out to God. And trust God for the outcome and the circumstances, just like Hannah, as we'll see, did. All right? At this time, be like Hannah, who was praying in her heart, fervent prayer. She was pouring herself out to the Lord and purposed to trust in him and his perfect word. Amen? Listen to a conversation with Eli the priest in verses 17 to 19a. Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went away and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home in Ramah. I want you to see Eli's words here. He said, may the God of Israel grant your request. He didn't say, thus saith the Lord, this is definitely going to happen. He said, may. And she responded, then may I find favor. She was trusting God. The result? The peace of God that passes all under understanding overtakes her, and she went away, look, no longer downcast. The peace of God came over her, and the joy of the Lord filled her. And not only, the next day she arose and she worshipped the Lord. She didn't get a yes, she didn't get a no, but she worshipped the Lord and trusted him. She didn't blame God, she didn't question his love and concern for her family, she didn't murmur and complain. She didn't sow to the flesh and reap its defect, uh, destructive consequences on her spiritual life or emotional life. She didn't become bitter or depressed. No. Instead, she prayed. She gave it to the Lord. She worshipped and trusted his will and sovereignty over her life and the lives of her children and the lives of her family. And moms, listen. When you see your children, when your children see a pattern like this in your life, and you become a living witness to them on how to approach the difficulties and adversities of life. What a godly example to your children when they see you crying out to God and trusting him and worshiping him. And why? Because it helps to plant those seeds of faith in our children. So when the situations come that are difficult and trying, cry out to God. Let them see you living that, that relationship with Christ. And it will help to build that kind of faith in them because they saw a godly woman who trusted her heavenly Father and her Lord and Savior. Listen to 2 Timothy 1.5. Speaking of Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Moms, you're a living 
testimony of the gospel and of the Lord when your children see a living faith in you. Amen? Listen, you can preach to them all you want. You can uh, say all you want. You can bring them to church and everything, which you, you know, should do, must do. But when they see that godly example, it teaches so much more than the words that come out of our mouths. They see us living our faith. They see you living your faith as a godly mom, and it can permeate their hearts and plant those seeds of faith in them. Amen? Now, a second point of application. Moms, dedicate your child to the Lord and purpose to stay that course. Don't give up. The number one priority for you, Mom, for us parents, is to seek the Lord and make Him our number one priority in our lives. And as we commit our lives to Him and desire to be like Him, and we learn His Word and do His Word, if you will, its principles and commandments, and then purpose to put them into practice, we are setting the foundation for our children to come to know Christ and walk with Him when they see it in our lives. So we dedicate our children to the Lord, then we live it, and we, what, introduce them to Jesus and His Word. And family, from an early age, moms from an early age, why? Children mimic their parents. And if we demonstrate Christ-like qualities prayerfully, they will mimic them also as they grow in the Lord. May they go this way and this way and this way? Possibly, but we're planting the seeds so that they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If we set the example, if they witness a consistency in our lives as parents and the intimacy we have with the Lord, we're laying the groundwork for them to come to know Christ also. Parents, make Christ the center of your home. Make his ways your ways. Make his priorities your priorities. Because you're the ones, we are the ones, moms, that are going to etch the blank tablets of their hearts, right, with either the word of God, the examples of God, Christ-like qualities, or the things of the world. They're going to learn one way or the other. If we're faithful, they experience faithfulness. If you compromise, they'll compromise also. Listen, parents, we get to influence them before they go out and are bombarded by the world, the ungodly influences of a corrupt and fallen world system. So let us purpose to build a strong foundation on the Word of God while at the same time letting them see that consistency lived out in our lives. Listen to Deuteronomy 6, 4-9. This is one of those you may want to paste up in your, in your prayer closet. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is talking to the parents, for us to love Him. These commandments that I give you today are be on your hearts, parents' hearts first. Then impress them on your children. Talk about them when they sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gate. So what he's saying is that all of our life experiences, bring Jesus into it. Bring Jesus into it. And then Proverbs 3, 1 to 7, another one you may want to cut out and paste up. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct our paths. So we want to plant these seeds so that our children what? will look to the Lord and the Lord will direct their path. Train them up, parents. Lay the foundation through the word of God. Build up your home on the principles of scripture. Be a living witness of Jesus Christ and then fulfill that role to train up your children. And then prayerfully and fervently keep praying and pouring into them that prayerfully they will follow the Lord as they get older. And listen, at times it's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take sacrifice. But listen, we want our kids, right, to experience things in this life, but we never want to compromise. And here's the deal. Let them see commitment in us. If we want them to be committed to the Lord, then we have to show that same commitment in our lives. We set the example. So we want to mirror the things of God. We want to make the Lord's priorities our priorities. And we want to teach them to our children to follow the same path, not in fanaticism or legalism, but let them see a humble and contrite heart in us that they will do the same. And listen, if Hannah was here this morning, 
she could tell you about sacrifice because after Samuel was weaned, she kept her vow to God and delivered him to Eli, the priest, and she only got to visit him a few times a year. Do you hear me? She only saw her little, her little boy three times a year. Now, another thing we need to be sensitive to, moms, parents, are looking at the individual gifts that God has given to our children. We as parents should help develop and guide our children in the life calling that they have as individuals. Remember, God created us to be co-workers with him. And each one of us has a different task within the kingdom, and he gives us those gifts and talents to what? Fulfill that task. He's created each one of us differently. Read Psalm 139. So listen, even as the general principles of our home may be the same, we act and react to each child differently because they have different personalities. So at this point, as parents, we have to be sensitive to our children's abilities and personalities, and we're to help them unfold their life calling that God has, has called them to. Look, I look at my daughter, Rachel. From early on, in fourth grade, they would use her, right, to go into a classroom and help with the uh, special needs children. Then she worked with my wife in the nursery school and was ministering to children. She worked in our nursery, in the children's programs in our church at, at one time. And now she uh, just graduated and is going to be a teacher in early ed. This was, I, we could see, my wife and I could see these qualities in her. And we helped nurture that. And now hopefully she'll go out and be an influence in young children's lives. But these were her qualities. Other people have other qualities, other gifts, other talents that God will develop. But we have to see those in our children and help nurture them. And if Hannah was here, if we looked at, she dedicated her son to the Lord and gave him over to God, she gave Samuel over to God, that God would use his gifts and talents and abilities in the way that God wanted, wanted to do that. And as we'll see, he becomes one of the greatest prophets in Israel's history. All right? But with this said, let me conclude this morning by stating this, that Hannah persevered in the Lord even for her future. Hannah made the ultimate commitment, the ultimate sacrifice that any mom could make. She totally gave her son over to the Lord and held nothing back. She committed Samuel to the Lord even before he was conceived, dedicated him to the Lord, and then when he was weaned, she gave him over to the Lord to be used by the prophet Eli. And I want you to see that this was not a momentary commitment, but it was a once-for-all commitment, and she never looked back. Family, Hannah persevered through difficulty. She persevered through discouragement and desperation. But more than that, she persevered in her faith in Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the same God we serve. And in her heart of hearts, even before she conceived, she purposed to dedicate her child to the Lord and to the call that God had on her child's life. And let me tell you, this took sacrifice. She gave her three-year-old son over to the Lord and dedicated him to the Lord and left him with Eli and went back to her hometown so that he could fulfill his life calling. But through it all, she also persevered in what the future would hold for her. She trusted in God. She trusted in Yahweh. And isn't it interesting that the Lord blesses her? She has three other sons and two daughters. So God blessed her with even more children. Just read 1 Samuel 2, 20 to 21. The barren woman persevered and was blessed to have Samuel, the prophet, as her son. And she had five other children. Family, the Lord blesses faithfulness in his time and in his way. Amen? So let me end with this. To you parents, to you moms, there will be times of difficulties, times of discouragement, or possibly even desperate times when you feel overwhelmed by the wonderful and challenging call you've been given as a parent, as a mom. But like Hannah, purpose to persevere because of the one who holds you in the palm of his hand. Dedicate your child, your children to the Lord. Train them up in the word of God. Set before them a consistent example of Christ. And then trust God to bring about the fruit of your faith, commitment, and perseverance because of the desire you have in your heart. Your desire for your children to know Christ as their Lord and Savior and to be used by him for his glory and his honor. Stay the course. Stay the course. Persevere, just like Hannah. Persevere, because the God that Hannah served is the same God as we serve. He's your God, he's my God, he's our God, and he will bless that faithfulness. Amen? 
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the godly examples that you give us in Scripture. We thank you for the Hannahs. We thank you, Lord, for the others that showed that persevering faith. And Lord God, I pray for our moms, that you would give them that persevering faith as a wife, as a mother. Lord God, that they would just live that godly Christian life as a godly woman and be that influence in a home that only a mom can be. Lord, moms are the glues that really hold the family together. So we pray this morning for all our moms that they would, my God, just continue to be a godly example in their families, that they would love their husbands, Lord, that they would love their children, that they be fervent prayer warriors for their families, Lord, that they would intercede before the throne for them, my God. I pray a special blessing on all our moms today. And Lord, for those of us who have lost our moms, we just pray that uh, you, we just remember and just hold those things dear to our heart as we remember the wonderful times in our lives that we spent with our moms and what they poured into us. Father God, bless this day. Make it extra special, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name we say, amen.